Uh, my name is Dave Zapponi. I'm the CEO of ECHO, otherwise known as the Educational Council for Homeowners. Today's community conversation will be on fiduciary duties and the HOA as a separate entity. ECHO is a 50-year-old statewide nonprofit association established to support HOA board members and engaged homeowners. Our mission is to foster a better quality of life in community associations through education, advocacy, and connections. For today's event, we have a few housekeeping items which were sent to you before the webinar. They are now presented on your screen. Please take a moment and review them. During, the, during our webinar, if you have technical issues, please use the chat feature to report them. You may also use the chat feature to talk with one another. We do not monitor the chat for questions. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. Today, we have a large audience of more than 400 registered attendees. Um, and most of these, if not all, are HOA board members or members of an HOA community. We will do our best to answer your questions, but we will likely run out of time uh, to answer all of the questions. Our apologies in advance. We use the thumbs up icon found in the Q&A feature to prioritize participant questions. Simply click on the upvote icon to select your favorite questions. Those questions with the most upvotes will be answered first in the Q&A session. Please keep your questions general in nature and short. Questions about specific situations are better asked of your attorney or another appropriate industry professional familiar with your specific situation. We will respond in writing to some questions during the presentation. All other questions will be answered during the Q&A or the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Now, let me direct your attention to, our, to your monitor once again, where you will find our disclaimer. None of what is said during the seminar shall be construed as specific legal advice, expert advice, or expert advice from the speaker, sponsors, or ECHO. If you wish advice, we encourage you to contact your attorney or another suitable expert. The information we provide during this webinar is educational in nature and should not be relied upon for specific decision-making purposes. Thank you for that. This, this event, as well as all of our events, is made possible by our generous sponsors. Please join me today in thanking our premier sponsor, Heritage Bank of Commerce, and today's registration sponsors, Levy, Erlinger, and Company, LLP, CPAs. And now, Linnell Soto will say a few words about the Heritage Bank of Commerce. Linnell? Thank you so much, Dave. I'm uh, very happy to be a premier sponsor with Heritage Bank of Commerce today. My name is Lionel Soto. I also have one of my coworkers in the audience today. Hi, Chris. Her name is Chris Lucas. Uh, Heritage Bank of Commerce is a community bank that was started in 1995. We have uh, several specialty verticals, one of them being HOA. We offer all the products and services that can help your HOA maintain uh, their accounts and reserves uh, fully FDIC insured. We have HOA operating accounts. We have HOA reserve accounts. We have insured cash sweep accounts. We also have insured uh, CD placement service and certificates of deposit. We offer lockbox services, both through mail and electronic payments, information reporting through online banking, images of your checks and statements, and you can also do remote capture through there. I look forward to uh, listening to this presentation from Lance, and uh, some very good information is going to be shared today. I also like to share information. So if you don't, if you're not a customer, but you just have a question about best practices for banking for your HOA, please feel free to reach out to me. I will type in my contact information in the chat and I look forward to the presentation. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Linnell. We appreciate it. And oh, we have a raffle today. We are giving away a $50 gift card at the end of today's program, courtesy of IQV Construction. You must be present to win. So stay to the end and we are going to draw a winner. 
Please support your professional member, our, our professional members, and especially our sponsors. They make our educational programming possible a li at little or no cost to you. Thank you very much to our sponsors. Introduction to our speaker today. And now we'll talk about Lance Stewart, attorney at, and partner at La Angus and Terry LLP. They exclusively represent homeowner associations throughout California. Angus and Terry provides HOAs with general counsel, construction defect uh, counsel, and other types of litigation representation. Lance works closely with HOA boards, boards to guide them through the rapidly changing array of legal obligations. He works with the HOA boards to provide practical advice and to help boards manage their communities while remaining compliant with state and local laws. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lance, please take it away. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, David. Thanks to, uh, to Echo for setting this up. Uh, and thanks so much to everyone uh, who's showing up today and taking time out of your day to attend this presentation. It's wonderful, the, the tremendous volume of people that we have. Uh, again, my name is Lance Stewart, um, and we're going to talk about uh, acting as your board for your HOA. Uh, every HOA board member in the state of California, including everyone on this call today that, that are board members for your HOA, is placed in a fairly difficult position. You are all volunteers uh, working in your spare time to oversee what we might as well consider uh, a multi-million dollar, if not billion dollar uh, corporation. And there are remarkable stakes to the decisions that you make and the decisions that you don't make. And for that responsibility, you're not really given any particular uh, training or credentials or qualifications or certifications. You're just supposed to uh, figure it out. This presentation is intended to try to give you at least a basic understanding of sort of the rules of the road for the role that you play. So if we could move on to the, the first slide here. So many of the problems that HOAs seem to grapple with seem to stem from a fundamental misunderstanding of, of this question. What exactly is a homeowner's association? There's a tendency to think of an HOA board as sort of a, a miniature city council, maybe baked into your community, uh, or maybe like your board is comparable to your representatives in Congress. Or at the other end of the spectrum, some folks might like to think of the HOA as sort of their own personal fiefdom and they get to call the shots for everybody. Uh, maybe sometimes we feel like the HOA is the people in the community, our friends and neighbors, uh, or the land that we live on. And it's not really any of those things. A homeowners association usually is a corporation, a legal construct, birthed into existence when the builder filed the Articles of Incorporation with the California Secretary of State. And like all corporations, it's run by a board of directors. And those directors are elected by the members, but once elected, they're responsible for deciding how nearly all business uh, on behalf of the HOA is conducted. And they only get that authority by coming together in a properly noticed meeting with an agenda and at least a quorum of the board present acting pursuant to that agenda. And so a point we're gonna emphasize throughout this presentation uh, goes back to this question uh, of what is an HOA? And that is that individual board members uh, are not themselves the HOA, have no particular individual or independent authority to act on behalf of the HOA. They get that authority by coming together uh, in a properly noticed meeting where uh, a majority of the board ends up making decisions on behalf of the HOA. And we're gonna use those words over and over again uh, throughout this presentation. So moving on to the next slide. Okay, so homeowners association is usually, is, is a nonprofit corporation, sometimes an unincorporated association created for the purpose of managing a common interest development, the land that you live on. That's the development, the property that you live in. That's the development being managed by the HOA. Uh, and they have four basic forms, a community apartment project, a condominium project, a planned development, or a stock cooperative. HOAs are usually organized as uh, nonprofit mutual benefit corporations. They were first regulated in the state of California in 1963 by something called the California Condominium Act, as well as parts of the uh, Corporations Code, parts of the Civil Code. The Davis-Sterling Common Interest Development Act is the primary part of California law governing each of your HOAs. It's not the only part of the law, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but it's the big one. 
something like 35% of residents living in the state of California, just over 14 million people live in an HOA. That's 49,520 different communities, all essentially running themselves. So we need laws to try to make sure all those communities are, are running themselves more or less the same way. Uh, and the Davis-Sterling Act is a critical piece of that. Now it's moved around over the years, but it's currently located in the California Civil Code at sections uh, 4,000 to 6150. We're gonna talk in the next slide about both the Davis-Sterling Act and some of the other laws that govern uh, your community. Uh, so we can move on uh, to the next slide, okay? Uh, the Davis-Sterling Act, again, is sort of ground zero for what governs your HOA. It gives us a lot of the most common uh, terms, what those terms mean, what is an HOA, what is a common interest development, common area, what's a condominium, and so on. Uh, and gives us sort of the, the broad strokes and a lot of the nuts and bolts for things that HOAs have to deal with. Governing documents, uh, board adopted rules, uh, who gets to use the property in what way, who maintains what, finances, assessments, dispute resolution, and of course, construction defect uh, litigation. Uh, again, that's not the only part of the law that governs you though. The corporation's code still plays a critical role in a variety of issues. Uh, HOAs are also considered housing providers by both federal and state law, which means you're bound by a variety of federal and state laws and regulations concerning things like uh, discrimination or disability issues, things along those lines. The California Vehicle Code also has something to say about uh, HOAs, uh, including some very strict requirements for what you have to do before you can tow someone's vehicle and possible penalties if you don't go about it the right way. And there are other authorities that govern HOAs as well. These are the big ones when we're talking about uh, the law. Moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. The goal of these laws is to ensure uniformity in the way HOAs are managed and operated, uh, as well as to provide uh, guidelines to the board and help delineate uh, the responsibilities between the HOA and the individual homeowners. Who's responsible for what? Who gets to do what? Uh, moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about the relationship between the law and your governing documents. You are governed by the law, but you're also governed by your HOA's specific governing documents, which get into the nuts and bolts of your particular community. This list here outlines the sort of relative hierarchy of those various authorities from top to bottom. Uh, if there's a conflict between these authorities, the one higher up tends to uh, decide the issue. The law, with some exceptions, it, it is, usually going to dictate the situation. Sometimes the law sort of goes out of its way to say, if the governing documents say something different, then that controls. But if there's a conflict, usually the law is going to trump uh, uh, your governing documents. That's followed by your Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions, what we call your CCNRs, uh, and your Articles of Incorporation. That's then followed by your bylaws, and that's then followed by your operating rules. Um, the CCNRs and the bylaws, as far as the law is concerned, are actually a contract between the HOA and each individual homeowner, meaning that whether folks are actually reading them or not, they are deemed as a matter of law to have read them, to know everything uh, that's in the CCNRs and the bylaws, and to have actually agreed to them. Um, and that's how the HOA has the authority to sort of impose different things on homeowners and require things of different homeowners. But it's also the HOA's uh, obligations. Um, and those documents, the CCNRs and the bylaws, usually can't be amended without a vote uh, of the members. Um, the CCNRs tend to be uh, substantive in nature, uh, sort of the meat of what's going on in your HOA. Uh, how the HOA and the homeowners get to use the property, uh, how they get to use the common area, if there are amenities in your development, uh, who maintains what, uh, how you handle architectural applications, things along those lines, those are going to be in your CCNRs. The bylaws tend to be more procedural in nature. Uh, how are meetings set up? Uh, what are the notice requirements for meetings? Uh, how are elections run? Thing along, things along those lines. Your operating rules are sort of a different animal from your CCNRs and your bylaws. Rules are entirely determined by the board, okay? Uh, members get a chance to voice their opinion, but at the end of the day, uh, they don't get a vote. The board itself decides whether to adopt a rule or not. And so for that reason, HOA rules can be much more susceptible to a legal challenge than say your 
CCNRs in your bylaws. So anytime you're adopting a rule, you wanna work very closely with your council uh, to prepare that properly, make sure it lines up with the authority you actually have. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, we're talking about the actual board, you guys. Um, the bylaws contain the logistics and procedure for operating the corporation, operating the HOA. You, the board, are, of course, elected by a membership vote. The big exception to that is if there's a, a vacancy uh, between terms, the board has the ability to, uh, by a majority vote of the board, fill that seat to, fill out, uh, to finish out the term. Uh, but usually board members are uh, elected by the members. Uh, there's usually three to four officers, a president, a uh, vice president, a treasurer, or CFO, a secretary. Um, and your authority and obligations are, as I said, set forth in the bylaws and the CCNRs. Last, this last point is critical. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, individually, board members usually have no particular authority. You come together in a meeting and a majority of the board decides how to run the HOA and gives directions to the management company who then actually runs the HOA for you. You're elected to make decisions about how to run the HOA, not to actually handle day-to-day -day affairs uh, yourself. And we're gonna talk about that idea more as we go along. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, your authority is again set forth in your CCNRs and bylaws, as well as the Davis-Sterling Act. Uh, uh, you'll see sometimes in the, uh, in the governing documents, the HOA has the power to do X. The HOA has the responsibility to do why. That's the board. Uh, again, not individual board members, but collectively, the board comes together and has the powers given to the HOA by the governing documents and also has the responsibilities, the obligations given to the HOA by the governing documents. You come together in that properly notice meeting, make decisions about how to run the HOA, and the board, for all intents and purposes, becomes the HOA. Your primary task is to take actions to make sure the HOA functions as intended is maintenance being performed uh, properly? Uh, are bills getting paid? Are you passing an annual budget? Uh, are you enforcing the governing documents? Things along those lines. That's your role, is to make sure the HOA is doing what it's supposed to do. You fill midterm vacancies, you adopt rules, you appoint officers, you might create committees to help you navigate uh, the various responsibilities, and you retain a qualified entity to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the HOA, that being your professional management company. And again, we'll come back to that idea more in a little bit. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, your obligations are to exercise all powers and undertake all duties of the HOA. That goes back to the idea that when the board comes together in that properly noticed meeting, you, you basically become uh, the HOA. Uh, you take actions to ensure the peace, health, comfort, safety, or general welfare of the community. You use prudence when handling the HOA's finances and you enforce the provisions in the governing documents. Uh, we're gonna talk in the next slide about some of the uh, limitations on your power. I said at the top that the board is responsible for uh, nearly all decision-making on behalf of the HOA. These are the major exceptions. Again, the board doesn't elect itself, the members elect the board. And what I said earlier about the board being able to fill vacancies, the big exception to that is following a recall election. If the members have said, we want so-and-so off the board, the board can't then fill that seat. That has to be filled by another membership vote. Um, most HOAs come with some uh, amount of exclusive use of the common area. Everybody has property that actually belongs to the HOA, but it's assigned to them for their individual use, patios, balconies, parking spaces, and so on. If the HOA is gonna consider granting new exclusive use of the common area to one person, that can only be done by a membership vote. Two thirds of the members have to sign off on that. Um, the board has the authority to increase monthly dues, regular assessments by up to 20% each year, and can levy a special assessment on its own authority of up to 5% of your budgeted gross expenses for that fiscal year, meaning reserves and operating, taken together, whatever 5% of that is, the board can impose a special assessment on the members of up to that amount. But if you're consulting with your management company, consulting with your CPA, and you determine the HOA needs more money than you actually then you can impose through that 20% on monthly dues or 5% special assessment. Uh, you've got to do that through membership vote. Anything more than a 20% increase in monthly dues, anything more than a 5% special assessment, the members have to decide that. Um, and finally, the board usually cannot unilaterally amend the bylaws and the CCNRs. There's some limited exceptions to that, but by and large, if there's going to be a change to the CCNRs and the bylaws, that's got to be done by membership vote uh, as well. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. 
Okay, we're gonna talk about management. Uh, and we have sort of alluded to these ideas a few times. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty now. Your manager, your management team is the HOA's legal agent. Uh, again, the board comes together in a properly noticed meeting, makes decisions, and then your management team actually enacts those decisions from one meeting to the next. Uh, the manager's role is to be the agent of the HOA, to be the face and the voice of the HOA from one meeting to the next. If somebody wants to talk to the HOA between board meetings, that's the manager, that's the person they need to talk to. Why is that so important? Because the manager at every level is acting pursuant to the decisions of a majority of the board during a properly noticed meeting. Uh, at every level, that's the case, whether we're talking about the content of the HOA's contract with that management company, uh, standing orders from the board to the manager, uh, or any given specific decision in a board meeting. The manager is always conducting themselves pursuant to the proper decisions of the board. Uh, if I'm on the board and a homeowner approaches me out on the street and says, uh, I think you should fix something. And I say, well, yeah, gee, the, the HOA should fix that. I've just made a promise on behalf of the HOA that I don't have the authority to make. The manager might have that authority through prior decisions from the board. I don't. The rest of the board doesn't know I've just had that conversation. Certainly the membership has no way of knowing that that conversation just occurred. So as a board member, when something catches your eye, uh, you see an important issue in the community, uh, a maintenance issue, a governing documents violation, a vendor not doing their job. Uh, think of this basic protocol. You want to reach out to the manager. An email is fine for this. Uh, I would like this issue to be on the agenda for our next meeting. You say that to the manager. The management company then assembles the packet for the board's meeting uh, with all the pertinent information and documents regarding that issue. The board reviews those materials before the meeting, and then in the meeting, you discuss it, and you try to persuade each other of what actually needs to happen with that issue. And somewhere in that discussion, uh, somebody on the board makes a motion. And somebody else either seconds that motion or not, and a majority of the board determines whether that motion actually passes. And if it does, that motion then becomes the will of the HOA and an instruction to the manager for handling that issue. That's the general uh, protocol. That's the through pattern you want to be thinking about for conducting HOA business. Something catches your attention, get in the habit, uh, not of walking up and trying to address it yourself, but reaching out to the manager this is an important issue. I'd like it on the agenda for our next meeting. That's what you should be thinking about. So the role of professional management is to facilitate corporation business by following the direction of a majority of the board when at least a quorum is assembled. They provide general guidance as to running the HOA, and they're going to be the point of contact between the HOA and the outside world, vendors, homeowners, whoever. Again, if somebody wants to talk to the HOA, that means the manager. The manager should be facilitating all those communications. Um, they're gonna provide advice to the board regarding the logistics of meetings, hearings, and notices to the members. And they're gonna provide recommendations uh, of other experts or consultants or vendors you might wanna work with on the various issues that you're grappling with. We'll talk later on about the importance of experts, but for now, the point is that when you're looking for somebody to uh, assist you, uh, in a particular area, your manager is the best first place to stop to find the right person to work with you on that issue. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, again, your, your management company is the HOA's legal agent. They work with the board to carry out the, carry out the actions necessary uh, for the function of the corporation. Uh, I mentioned earlier the HOA's contract with the management company. That's usually going to specify uh, what, item, what items need express authority from the board, uh, but there's also going to be an element of implied authority. The idea is, to a certain extent, you want your management company to be running things on autopilot for you from one meeting to the next. Again, you want the management company to be the first line of communication. The contract will usually envision some limited discretionary spending to carry out the board's directives. Uh, but again, the management team takes direction from a majority of the board, not any one uh, board member. Okay, moving on to the next slide. All right, this is, I always say this is very much sort of the, the heart and soul of the presentation. This is your true north. This should be a factor in absolutely everything uh, you do, and that is your fiduciary duty as board members. So we're gonna talk about that. As board members, you are uh, fiduciaries of the corporation, meaning that you've taken on a, a certain responsibility um, that other homeowners haven't taken on. 
Everybody has various concerns about the HOA, but you've agreed to be responsible for the HOA. Every other homeowner isn't necessarily lying up awake at, at night uh, thinking about the HOA's problems. You've sort of taken on that responsibility. So for example, attorney-client privilege doesn't go to all the members in the HOA, it goes to the board. You guys have access to certain sensitive or privileged or confidential information because you need that full picture in order to be able to make uh, proper decisions on behalf of the HOA. So as fiduciaries, you have two primary uh, duties, uh, a duty of care and a duty of loyalty. Uh, we're gonna spend some more time on uh, duty of care. So we'll start with duty of loyalty. Uh, we're talking about conflicts of interest. We're talking about self-dealing. Uh, the first thing is this. Uh, if you're talking about a scenario where uh, you stand to benefit financially from a decision that the board might be making, uh, you got to keep away from that. Uh, number one, you shouldn't put yourself in that position as a general matter at all. But if you do, if it does come up, there are certain steps that the law requires. And again, this, is, this isn't in Davis Sterling. This is in the corporation's code. There are certain steps that are required to make sure that you've fully disclosed that issue and that it's handled properly to prevent it from becoming an issue uh, down the road. But generally, if you have any sort of potential financial interest at stake uh, in something the board's considering, uh, get away from it, recuse yourself, don't get involved. Um, as a general matter, when we're not talking about necessarily financial issues, um, but something stands to affect you in a way it doesn't necessarily affect all other members. There again, you're gonna to wanna to work with counsel, but you might wanna consider recusing yourself from that decision. So the classic scenario there might be, you know, I and my neighbor are at each other's throats. We're complaining about each other constantly. We're both alleging the other one is making a bunch of excessive noise or excessive smoke or whatever, but I'm also on my board. Should I really play a role in deciding whether the board is going to impose discipline against my neighbor for the complaints I'm making? Probably not. I probably need to take a step back. If you're faced with an issue where you think you might potentially have a conflict of interest, raise it. Tell the rest of the board, tell counsel, tell management. Uh, I get the question all the time. Lance, do I have a conflict of interest? And there's varying degrees of what needs to happen in response to a variety of scenarios, but err on the side of bringing it up so everybody can deal with it properly. Uh, duty of care. That's what we usually think of in terms of your uh, due diligence, your duty to investigate, your, your duty to have some understanding of what it is you're deciding before you actually decide it. And we're going to talk about that in the context of some related and bigger issues. Moving on to the next slide. Okay. This is what we call the business judgment rule, which your duty of care relates directly to. Uh, this is Corporations Code 7231. Uh, I'm going to read some parts of this and then we're going to break it down. A director, that's board members, shall perform the duties of a director in good faith, in a manner such director believes to be in the best interest of the corporation, and with such care, including reasonable inquiry, as an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would use under similar circumstances. Let's break that down on the next slide. Uh, three basic ideas. Uh, You've got to act in good faith in the best interest of the corporation using ordinary prudence and reasonable care. So here's the scenario. You're in a meeting, you're dealing with agenda business item you know, five. Uh, there's a motion on the table. You're about to cast your vote for or against that motion. These are the things you should be thinking about. Uh, am I acting in good faith in the best interest of the corporation and have I used ordinary prudence? Good faith is, you know, am I being honest about possible conflicts of interest? Did I actually review the materials uh, in my packet before looking into this? Am I properly weighing the various things that I should be thinking about in making this decision? Uh, best interest of the corporation means you've got to be thinking in terms of the whole kit and caboodle. You can't, of course, make decisions solely on the basis of what, you know, it would be nice for you would, or would be nice for the people on your side of the street. Um, and you also don't necessarily want to make a decision just to appease the sort of squeaky wheel. Somebody's making a bunch of noise. Uh, you know, we all have that person in our community who's making a bunch of noise, driving the board crazy, driving other homeowners crazy. Uh, you know, sometimes there might be an inclination to make a decision solely to get that person to go away. And you sort of can't do that either. You've got to think about what's best for the entire corporation. And that means the property, the legal entity, uh, and the homeowners. Uh, and that means not just now, but in the future. We've seen scenarios where an issue comes up, the board starts to try to address it, but doesn't fully resolve it, and it sits. 
and then it sits for decades. And then 30 years later, that problem then takes the form of a lawsuit against the HOA. Uh, we've seen it happen. Uh, you've got to be thinking in terms not just of uh, the decision you're making as it relates to the HOA today, but what does that corporation in the future need you to do today? Are you properly resolving that issue so it's not going to come back and bite the HOA uh, down the road? Um, and finally, decisions must be made using the same care and with a reasonable inquiry uh, as an ordinarily prudent person in the same situation. This is sort of the common sense piece of this. Uh, in the simplest terms, part of what we're talking about is making conservative risk averse decisions. There might be many scenarios where uh, what you would like to see happen isn't necessarily the best way of protecting the HOA's resources. You're talking about everybody's homes, everybody's properties, uh, the common area. We're not sort of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk uh, making the big plays with other people's money and hoping everything works out okay. Um, you want to err on the side of making the decisions that are protective of those resources, not committing a lot of money and resources that the HOA doesn't have, but keeping it uh, out of risk as much as possible. Uh, we're going to talk more in the next slide about this idea, though, of uh, reasonable inquiry. Your HOA is a uh, microcosm. Everything that can come up will come up. And you as board members can't possibly be expected to be experts in all of it. Your role ends up being to know enough to know when you don't know enough recognizing when you need expert guidance. And this is what I was touching on earlier. Uh, sometimes that's going to be consulting with your manager. Sometimes that's going to be consulting with legal. Uh, sometimes it's going to be a solar expert. Sometimes it's going to be a plumber. Sometimes it's going to be a CPA. There are any of a number of situations where uh, you all bringing your layperson's uh, understanding to bear on the situation isn't going to be enough. You need to work with an expert and figure out uh, what needs to happen. So you want to say to the manager, we need somebody to teach us about this issue before we make a decision. You've got a duty to act based on reasoned decision-making. This is part of that process. Um, does that mean you always need an expert? No, of course not. You need to recognize when you do. Do you always do exactly what the expert says? Not necessarily. You're gonna reasonably rely on that expert. So for example, if I'm giving a legal opinion, I might often say, okay guys, here's option A. Here are the pros and cons of option A. Here's option B and the pros and cons of that. And now it's your decision. What would you like to do? So when issues come up, uh, you're going to inquire and consult with individuals with specific knowledge on that issue. You're going to retain their services to get an educated opinion on how to address the issue. Um, you're going to rely on that opinion when you as a board are discussing it. Uh, and you're going to make decisions in reasonable reliance on that opinion. Uh, on the next slide, we're going to bring all these things together. Why are all these things so important? Uh, good faith, best interest of the corporation, reasonable inquiry, ordinary prudence. Why are those things so important? Because these are what protect you as board members from your potential personal liability for the decisions you make while serving on the board. Uh, there's a, a parallel portion of the Davis-Sterling Act that says in essence, um, if there's a lawsuit against the HOA that centers on a decision you participated in and you're named, as a defendant in that lawsuit, your potential personal liability should be capped at the limits of the HOA's applicable insurance policy. So that even if you're found liable, that money isn't coming out of your pocket. Uh, and there's an argument under this provision and related provisions of the corporation's code that uh, as long as you were complying with the business judgment rule, you should not have any personal liability. But these are your guardrails. This is how you keep yourself out of danger is making sure with every single decision you make that you've thought these things through. Am I acting in good faith, in the best interest of the corporation? Have I used ordinary prudence? Did we conduct a reasonable inquiry to have an expert uh, teach us about these issues? Um, and that's what's going to protect you from potential uh, personal liability. That's why these things are so critical uh, to all your decision making. Okay, moving on to the next slide, we're going to start to talk about meetings. You've heard me say over and over and over again, HOA business must be conducted during properly noticed meetings of the board. Uh, why is that so critical? That's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, we've got some provisions here from what's called the Open Meeting Act, which is part of the Davis-Sterling Act. The first reason you always conduct business during properly noticed meetings uh, is because 
you want to make sure you're being transparent and accountable to the members. That's how you do that. You don't conduct business over email. You don't conduct business out in the hallway. You don't conduct business out on the lawn. Um, you do it during a meeting when members know that it's happening. But these provisions here, uh, and I'm not going to read every word of them, but we take them all together. And what we end up with is for the board to conduct any HOA business, there has to be a notice sent out to members ahead of time telling the members what the agenda is for that meeting. It has to go out at least four days ahead of time, and the board usually can only conduct the business that is on that agenda. Moreover, you can't conduct HOA business during uh, over email. We'll talk in a minute about emergency determinations. That's the one thing that can happen over email. But by and large, what we've got here is if you're going to do any HOA business, you have to tell members ahead of time there has to be an agenda. And when you get to that meeting, you stick with what's on that agenda. Uh, why are these things so immediately critical to the HOA? The next slide goes into some other provisions from this same law that basically say, if the board doesn't comply with the Open Meeting Act, any homeowner in the HOA at any time can bring a lawsuit just for the technical violation of the Open Meeting Act. It might not even matter what the decision they care about is, it might just be the technical violation of the Open Meeting Act. And that homeowner can recover civil penalties of up to $500 for each violation. Uh, they can get back their attorney's fees. They can get back their court costs from the HOA. And here's the kicker. Even if the HOA prevails in that lawsuit, the law is structured so the HOA, barring unusual circumstances, doesn't get back its court cost or its attorney's fees. Um, that's the sort of immediate consequences of not sticking with this rule of conducting all business during a properly noticed meeting with an agenda. Okay, on the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, the different types of meetings. Annual meetings are a little bit of an artifact, and bylaws vary in what they actually say, uh, but that's often when uh, elections occur. It might be when a budget is passed. Uh, it might be when the annual policy statements uh, go out to members. That's usually what we're talking about with the annual meetings of the board and of the members. Regular open meetings of the board uh, are where most business is going to be uh, conducted. Garden variety HOA business that doesn't occur in executive session, it's always going to be in these open regular meetings of the board. Special meetings of the members are a bit of a, an unusual scenario. 5% uh, or more of the members can serve a petition on the HOA saying, we would like to hold a meeting. Uh, usually that's going to be when a recall vote is happening. There might be other things as well where the members are saying, we want this type of meeting to happen. Uh, the law is very specific on what the HOA has to do in response to a petition along those lines. When you get that, always get your council involved right away. Executive session meetings of the board, we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, for those meetings, members still need to know that it's happening. You provide notice to members. This is for two days ahead of time rather than four days ahead of time uh, for the open meetings. Um, but that meeting is closed to the members. Members can't attend. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, emergency meetings. This is the only scenario in which the board can make substantive decisions over email. We're talking about a true emergency. Uh, you know, water is gushing into somebody's home. Uh, management has already done the steps they can to can, they can within their power. They need further guidance from the board. Uh, it can't wait uh, until the next regular open board, be board meeting, uh, and there's no way you could have seen it coming. So you have an emergency meeting. Two basic ways of doing that. Uh, one is that uh, you know a quorum of the board. Uh, jumps on a conference call, jumps on Zoom, and a majority of those present decide what the next step is. Or you can make an emergency decision over email if it is completely unanimous from all board members and every single board member has agreed to make that decision over email. Um, that's going to be the exception rather than rule, the rule. There are very specific things you have to do, but that's the only time you're actually conducting business over email. And either way, uh, that action then needs to be documented in the minutes for the next regular board meeting. Um, okay, so those are the various types of meetings. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about executive session meetings. Again, members are entitled to notice that, that it's happening. They're not entitled to attend. Five basic topics that are appropriate for executive session. Uh, litigation, which we typically interpret to mean uh, active lawsuits, but also the threats of lawsuits, situations where attorney-client privilege is critical, uh, assisting the board in assessing uh, the HOA's potential liability, things along those lines. Uh, forming contracts with third parties, 
Uh, there's a lot of sort of sausage making going on there that you need to uh, do an executive session. Uh, among other things, you don't necessarily want the various vendors who are bidding for the job to know what each other are uh, putting up for the job. Member discipline uh, generally needs to be an executive session. Personnel matters. If you have direct employees for your HOA, that's going to be an executive session. And if you've got a member who's behind on their uh, monthly dues and needs to work out an agreement with the board to resolve that, that can be done in executive session as well. Anything that doesn't fit into one of those categories has to be done during an open meeting. And if you're ever uh, confused or concerned about whether something falls under these categories or not, uh, work with counsel. Sometimes there can be some nuance to it um, and you wanna decide what's, what's appropriate by working with counsel and whether you can in fact do that in executive session or it needs to be an open session. Okay, moving on to the next slide. I keep saying, don't conduct business outside of a properly noticed meeting. When you get to your properly noticed meeting, have at it. That's what you're there to do. You're there to conduct the HOA's business. Everything you've been thinking about, whatever issues are on the agenda, everything you've been keeping to yourself and not saying on email and not saying out in the common area and not saying to your neighbors because Lance told you not to, this is the time when you talk about it. You get into the meeting and you have the, the full-throated debate with the other board members. Um, you persuade each other, you advocate for your view, and somewhere in there, uh, somebody makes a motion and somebody seconds that motion or not, and then a majority of you decide uh, what's gonna happen next. Um, the agenda, again, determines the only topics you can talk about at that meeting. Um, agenda items I've mentioned a few times can be added by board members, they can't be added by homeowners, and it's okay to email management with those proposed agenda items. Logistical, administrative things, those are fine over email. Uh, the agenda items, hey guys, we're thinking about meeting next Wednesday, I can't make it, how about Thursday? That's all fine for email. Where you get yourselves into trouble is when you start talking about the actual substance of the agenda items. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, okay, homeowners forum. When you're in a board meeting, it is a meeting of the board. You're there to conduct the board's business. You're there to conduct the HOA's business. Homeowners have their opinions. That's entirely fine. You should hear from them, but only during the homeowners forum portion of the agenda. Once that part of the agenda is done, you've got to be able to cut folks off and conduct your business and reach a decision on your agenda items. Now, the homeowners forum can be tricky if a homeowner is raising an issue for the first time. Uh, I just got through saying you can only take action on items that are on your agenda for that meeting. Well, if a homeowner comes up during the homeowner's forum and is raising something for the first time and you've never heard of it before, by definition, it's not on your agenda. So you usually can't do anything about it, which can be a little socially awkward in that moment. You don't want to make the homeowner feel like uh, we don't really care. We're not listening to you. Um, but you can't do anything at that moment. So you want to get in the habit of saying things like this. Uh, Thanks very much. We'll look into it. Thanks very much. We'll take it under advisement. Thanks very much. We'll see about putting it on the agenda for an upcoming meeting. Say things along those lines. That way the homeowner knows they've been heard, they've been understood. It's just that as a procedural matter, you can't actually take action at that moment. Um, there are some situations where you can, but there are procedural hoops you have to jump through. So this is going to be the default rule. Uh, if the homeowner is asking for sort of an administrative update from management, uh, that's fine. Uh, homeowner issues, uh, like I say, should be put on the agenda for the next uh, board meeting. And you want to impose reasonable time limits, three to five minutes, uh, usually is plenty of time for folks to get things off their chest. Okay, moving on to the next slide. All right. You guys are the legal representatives of the HOA. You've heard me say a million times through this presentation, you can only discuss HOA matters during meetings. Outside of a proper meeting, Anything you say can and will be used against both you and the HOA. And that can be difficult. Again, it can be socially awkward. Your neighbor approaches you, uh, your friend approaches you, raises what seems like a legitimate issue. They call you on the phone, they send you an email, they approach you in the hallway or out in the common area, and you feel a natural impulse to want to say, yeah, sure, we should take care of that. But you can't actually do anything because not only does the board not know you're having that conversation, the membership doesn't know you're having that conversation. The membership doesn't know that you're conducting HOA business out there on the street. So again, you want to get in the habit of saying, uh, you know what, I can't actually help you with that issue. Do me a favor, contact the manager, and we'll look into putting on the agenda for an upcoming meeting. 
um, get in the habit of saying things along those lines. Don't say anything that's going to commit uh, you or the HOA to anything in particular. If you think it's important enough, you might want to contact the manager directly and propose that it be put on the agenda, but don't dare promise anything because you can't. And no matter how many times you say, you know what, I'm not speaking on behalf of the HOA when I say what I'm about to say, uh, this is just me talking, I guarantee you the person will believe that they are getting it right from the horse's mouth and that you are the HOA. Um, and this goes back to that critical piece about the business judgment rule and your potential personal liability. Something you say outside of a meeting that somebody interprets as you speaking for the HOA can expose not only the HOA to liability, but can expose you to personal liability. So you get approached, keep your responses very informal, very limited, uh, direct the homeowner or whoever it is to contact management, and don't try to get into a thing of distinguishing between whether it's you talking or the HOA talking, just demur on the entire topic. Okay, and that brings us to what I believe is the last uh, slide. To sum up, your HOA is a corporation. Uh, board members individually usually have no particular power. Decisions are made by a majority of the board during a properly noticed meeting. Communications usually need to be with the manager, the, a the HOA's legal agent between uh, meetings. When you're making decisions, you wanna keep the big picture in mind. Remember the HOA doesn't exist for the pleasure of any one person, but rather the community as a whole. You're not expected to know everything. You are expected to know when to get the right consultant or expert involved to teach you about the issue. So you are making decisions uh, that are in the best interest of the HOA. That's your best insulation from personal liability. Uh, you might want to also consider some other steps uh, to sort of enshrine these things for your community. Uh, homeowner trainings, going over the same information, but from a homeowner standpoint can be invaluable to making sure homeowners know what to expect when they're talking to the HOA, when they're talking to the board or talking to management. Um, you might want to also consider adopting a code of conduct uh, as a resource for addressing fiduciary duty concerns uh, and best practices. And that brings us to uh, the end of the presentation itself. And Dave, uh, are we doing Q&A next? Where are we at? Uh, yes, we definitely are going to be doing q and I want to thank uh, our sponsors once again, uh, uh, Heritage Bank of Commerce uh, and uh, Angus and Terry. You're, uh, you're actually uh, here on the slide as well. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, and let me get my little thing up here. Let's say for the Q&A section, uh, take a look at the, uh, the Q&A section, everybody here that's here today, and use the thumbs up sign. It's a little thumbs up uh, icon. Use the icon to vote for your favorite question, the one that you would like answered most quickly. And we're going to give you a little time to do that. Uh, so go ahead. There's, uh, I think we have uh, close to 40 questions in the 48 questions, and we're getting up to 50. I answered several along the way here. So uh, if you could, just take a couple minutes and look at it, and we'll see what's going on there, okay? Uh, Lance, do you see one here that you might want to take first? If you go up, you can say up in the upper right corner, you can do the most uh, upvotes, and that'll take you to the number one question. Can HOA board uh, distribute, distribute a redacted copy of the board package to its general membership? It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, thank you. And I wasn't seeing that question. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, of the board packet itself, a redacted copy, I suppose it's possible. There's actually a particular law that lays out in pretty clear terms what documents homeowners are entitled uh, to see. A board packet usually is going to have some combination of things that homeowners are entitled to see and things that uh, they're not necessarily entitled to see. Uh, I would say that maybe the best place to start is that statute, and I can't remember the code section off the top of my head, but there is a law that specifies things homeowners are entitled to ask for uh, financials, uh, meeting minutes, things along those lines. That might be the best place to start for the information that you're, that you're looking for. I hope that helps. Good start. <clears throat> Let's go to the top of the list. And Trish, do you see Trish on the top there? I do, yes. Okay. So we've got a question about, uh, how to handle a board who is deferring actions to management. And generally the idea of they're not doing what they're supposed to be uh, doing. Um, it's an interesting point. Uh, there's a difference between sort of deferring everything to management and properly relying 
on management. Uh, management serves two roles. Uh, one is to sort of be there as the agents of the agent of the HOA, but they're also there as their own expert in their own capacity. Remember, like I said at the beginning, every single board member uh, is a volunteer with no particular training, uh, doing the best they can, working in their spare time to run the entire HOA. They are absolutely dependent and reliant on a variety of experts, uh, most critically management, to decide how to do things. Uh, as a as a procedural matter, what should be happening is any given issue. Uh, is on the agenda for a meeting, the board discusses it, and they might, during that meeting, say, uh, management, what, what do you think about this issue? And then the board makes a decision. There's also going to be a level of things that, uh, not that they're being deferred to management, but management is being asked to handle, as they should be. The contract will envision uh, a level of things that management is expected to do, um, and uh, there might be, as I said earlier, standing orders from the board. We want you to handle this situation this way. Um, so it's a fine line, but I think generally what should be happening is working with management to make sure the board is getting proper guidance. Uh, and if they're following what management is uh, advising, I don't see a problem with that. Um, yeah, so Lance, let me, let, me, let me chime in on that a little bit because sure. we have a lot of uh, self-managed associations. So mm -hmm. the buck stops here. So uh, your mm -hmm. volunteers, you need to. You are going to need to uh, make decisions on how to operate and run your run your business. Uh, make sure that you're well educated. And you know this, and you have good experts to rely on. So the main thing uh, with the business judgment rule is that you you need to rely on experts. And that's uh, I think what you're saying, Lance, is when mm -hmm. you got a manager, a competent manager, they are the ones you're relying on. But one thing I would like to add to that is make sure that you realize that um, the board. The board members and board as a collective group are it's where the buck stops. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, if, if the manager makes a mistake, it's not their mistake. It's your mistake. You need to manage them like you would a an employee uh, if you're running a corporation. A lot of you run corporations. So think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's it's difficult if you are. Uh, self-managed, absolutely. And, and Dave is absolutely right. You want to make sure you're getting the appropriate expert input. And the other piece of that is you want to have a clear record of who's actually responsible for speaking on behalf of the HOA between meetings. It's going to be one board member and you want to have documented clearly in your minutes. What is that person's authority? What exactly are they uh, able to say on behalf of the HOA? It gets tricky when you don't have that sort of singled out role of management, but there are ways of doing it uh, to protect everyone involved. Well, you made a Absolutely. good point. You made a good point about the contract. The management relationship starts at the contracting during the contracting, and so you, you're going to have some representations when you are talking to the management firm. You'll have representations from that firm of what they can do for you. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that those are then put into the contract, and then you define the roles and duties of each uh, of the parties. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can take the next question here. Okay, anonymous. Uh, process of homeowners uh, going through the management company doesn't work if the maintenance company is incompetent, the one they're suggesting. So how is the board supposed to know that that, that is happening when they don't know what, uh, what the HO homeowner is contacting the management company about and the homeowner doesn't know that uh, what the management company is telling them is wrong? The mm -hmm. system is the blind leading the blind and doesn't work unless all parties are acting in good faith. So hope you understand great. that question. So yep. no, it's, it's a great question. And bear in mind, uh, I'm emphasizing the role of management, but there, there are two basic avenues for homeowners to communicate with the board. There's management, which uh, is usually going to be sort of the, the most efficient avenue, but there's also showing up at the homeowners forum. That's your opportunity to speak directly to the board here's my concern. I'm concerned about X and Y and Z. I'm concerned about the lights in the community. I'm concerned about the landscaping. Whatever it is, you bring that to the homeowner's forum. If you feel like the message isn't getting through, come to the homeowner's forum. But understand that in that context, odds are uh, the board won't be able to take action in that moment. There can be a lot of impatience with, uh, I'm standing right here, the board's in front of me, I want an answer right now. Understand that because the issue you're bringing up isn't necessarily on that meeting's agenda, the board might not be able to do anything um, and they're going to be needing to figure out, okay, what's the proper step for acting on this if we do want to act on it? And that's probably going to mean putting it on the next agenda, which might be a month out, it might be a quarter out, so that they can gather the right information um, on whatever that topic is. And that goes back to this idea of the, the board packet, but also, you know, do they want to gather information from folks in the community? 
uh, do things along those lines so that when they make that decision, uh, they are, they can feel they're making it in the best interest of the HOA following a reasonable inquiry. Okay, so that's good. Um, and so uh, Scott, Scott Takota, Takata, I guess, but Scott, I can pronounce that well. Uh, can board members communicate outside of a meeting on a topic via electronic method, such as Slack, uh, such as Slack, uh, where the conversation is open to be viewed by membership? Can this be done if there is proper notice of a meeting on Slack, uh, making it visible to the HOA membership? Now, Slack, so for those of yeah. you, is, is a software program that allows collaborative conversations. A couple of interesting ideas there. So uh, first of all, I would say, uh, if you're talking about a scenario where you're by definition outside of a meeting, the board's on Slack, there hasn't been notice of a meeting, they're talking about HOA issues, I would say that probably doesn't uh, work. The whole point is that members have advanced warning of when and how the meeting is occurring, what the agenda is, what points are gonna be taken up. Um, if so, if you're all just sort of hope, and this is an increasing problem. Uh, if you're hopping on a community messaging board, next door, WhatsApp, things along those lines, there isn't any notification to the members who aren't there that you're conducting HOA business. That's the whole point. Um, your second idea, though, of what if we do a properly noticed meeting on Slack? I, I haven't specifically thought of that idea. We're now moving into a, a situation where uh, we're no longer going to be in a state of emergency. Uh, so the law is going to be less forgiving when it comes to virtual meetings. We're going to have to go back to uh, not exactly the way things were three years ago before COVID, but some variation of that, maybe more hybrid meetings uh, where you have a physical location, but it's also possible to attend via Zoom. Um, I don't know if, I think the nature of Slack probably wouldn't work even in that context because you're not sort of having an open uh, discussion. Uh, it's hard to sort of keep clear who's talking to whom. Uh, better to just do uh, Zoom or something along those lines. I don't think something over Slack would fall within the code's idea of what, a, what constitutes a meeting. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, we're we're going to be facing a lot more of the electronic uh, communications in the in the future. There is legislation now pending uh, to have allow mm -hmm. boards to continue to have. Uh, board meetings without a location. So that's that's something that's in the works. You can yes. have it with location though. Okay. Let's keep all, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. Yeah, uh, in post-pandemic, uh, in the post-pandemic world, what does a an HOA board need to do to continue having board meetings via uh, Zoom or virtual meetings? Oh, speak of the devil, that's yeah. the question. Okay. Great, great question, timely topic. And, and I can flesh out what I was talking about a moment ago. Okay, so here's the situation. Uh, before COVID, there was always the Open Meeting Act, and the basic idea was um, that you have a physical location, usually decided by your bylaws. Your bylaws will say the board meeting needs to be at the clubhouse. It needs to be within uh, one mile of the HOA. It needs to be within 75 miles of the HOA. The bylaws say where it is the physical location is supposed to be. Uh, the Open Meeting Act says, okay, the meeting needs to be at that location. However, it was always the case before COVID that the board might not necessarily be there. The board could attend via a conference call so long as it was possible for any homeowner to show up for that meeting and hear what was being said. That's always been the idea even before we all started using Zoom for everything. Um, and what we're seeing a lot of right now is uh, shifting to this sort of hybrid approach where the idea is gonna be, uh, you still send out a notice, you still have an agenda on that notice. You still provide the technical information for attending via Zoom or whatever it is, including, uh, I would recommend uh, information for technical support if somebody can't get in, but you also need that physical location. It's gonna be a slightly different approach than maybe what it was three years ago, but you still need to work with council, work with your management company um, to figure out what your bylaws require that physical location to be and have somebody there. Now we get questions along the lines of, you know, what if we sort of tell everyone ahead of time, uh, let us know if you want to attend in person, otherwise we're not going to have it uh, in person. Or what if we, you know, have the physical location, but then when nobody shows up, we close it down uh, 15 minutes later. Um, and I think those approaches don't quite work, at least until the legislature fixes the issue, which we all hope they do. But for right now, I think those approaches don't quite work because what the statute seems to envision is if I decide, you know, 
uh, 45 minutes into the board meeting that I want to uh, stroll down the street and attend the meeting, I should be able to do that. Uh, you can't sort of preemptively require folks to notify you whether they intend to uh, attend or not. So I think we're going to be looking more at sort of those hybrid meetings, uh, unless, you know, as David says, the legislature figures this out in the, uh, in the coming session. Okay. And so um, Steve, Steve Rubin, a uh, member of the board members club, in fact, um, he asks, uh, what are a couple of the biggest regrets that board members have when they discover the recently hired management company is not a good fit for the HOA? What Interesting. Are the regrets? Hmm. Um, it's an interesting question. I think it sort of goes to this broader point of, and, and Dave, you alluded to this earlier, when you're going through the process of hiring any vendor, but certainly a management company, you want to make sure you're, you're vetting that pretty well. You want to make sure you're working with uh, your counsel on looking over what the contract says and does that contract line up with what you're uh, looking at. I've certainly had situations where um, I'm asked by one of my boards to review the proposed management company contract. And the more we dig into it, the more it sort of becomes clear that what the board is looking for in a management company isn't really what this particular management company uh, has in mind. And maybe it is appropriate to look at somebody else. But that's sort of the the biggest thing is think in terms of how you prefer to conduct business um, and either work it out, as David says, uh, in the context of the contract, we want to conduct business this way. uh, Or if it turns out that that's not really how that management company functions, and maybe you want to work with with somebody else. I think the biggest issues that come up tend to be sort of um, going back to the point we talked about earlier, that communication issue. What what are the expectations? Um, And disconnects over how much involvement management is expected to have. Different boards have different expectations. Some boards uh, very much want uh, to be involved in absolutely everything. Uh, Some boards really want management to sort of handle things for them. And if there's a miscommunication from the get-go about what that expectation is, that's sort of where the biggest problems tend to come from. So work with whatever company it is, work with your counsel to anticipate those issues at the point of ironing out the contract before you've signed off on it. Mm-hmm. That's that's really good advice. Uh, one of the things that, that we're seeing um, that happens is that you'll get, you'll, you'll be talking to a uh, management firm and you'll speak to the the people that are in charge, maybe the director or someone who's who's managing it. And then they come in for a couple couple weeks, maybe a couple months, and they say, here's your new associate manager. And mm-hmm. they give you someone who has, you know, a, a limited amount of experience and you really haven't spent a whole lot of time talking with them. And so ask to see who you're going to be talking to on a mm-hmm. daily basis, who is your manager and what are the ways to communicate with the management firm. A lot of management firms now uh, have answering services and what have you that uh, you're not able to talk to an individual for a day or two. So that you yeah. need to, to understand all those processes when you're finding. We actually have a course on this. So uh, if you're really interested in uh, uh, what to do and what the issues are, we can we can have that in a different session. Yeah, we do. Uh, let's go to uh, Steve. Uh, oh, William uh, Monson. Uh, do you uh, do most HOAs require an inspection of the unit prior to sale to ensure that the owner of the unit did not do something that was not approved by the architectural committee? Interesting. Um, I haven't seen, I think there are governing documents that do envision something along those lines. I haven't seen a lot of that. Usually what we're talking about is um, that general question of of has that happened? Has there been a modification that wasn't approved? And are we maybe uh, finding out after the property has already been sold? Uh, And it's difficult for boards to grapple with that. because you can't really just, absent something expressed in the CCNRs, you can't just walk up into somebody's unit and say, hey, by the way, are you, uh, did you modify things in a way you're not supposed to? Um, typically what you wanna do, if you have reason to believe that there is a modification that wasn't, let me back up for a second. Different CCNRs say different things about what homeowners can and can't do with the interior of their unit. If you're talking about condos, um, usually the critical issues are are they tinkering with sort of uh, load-bearing structures? Are they tinkering with things that are actually getting into the common area? But a lot of times the governing documents don't necessarily care beyond those points. Uh, you don't necessarily need approval. If you're talking about a planned development um, and the interior of somebody's home. There might be many things that the, the governing documents have nothing to say about and you don't necessarily need architectural approval uh, to do. 
So that's that's something to understand going into it. If there's reason to believe that somebody has uh, potentially modified something that they weren't permitted to, um, I would start with maybe a, a courtesy notice, a notice to cure, something along those lines, or maybe call them into a hearing and explore the issue with them. Um, it, you can't really... Most CCNRs have some provision that envisions entering the unit, but you have to give uh, appropriate notice and it has to be for a legitimate re reason. Usually those are geared toward potential maintenance concerns, um, not necessarily you know, a suspected violation. Uh, so you have to tread carefully with that, definitely work with counsel on why it is you think the issue exists uh, and how you go about trying to address it. Sure, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. So just one more, uh, I wanna mention that um, in the look to the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of your screen normally uh, your, and uh, call, pull up the Q questions that are being asked. And if you could vote for uh, your favorite questions, uh, we have 76 in the queue right now. And I know we've answered about 30 of them otherwise. So we have quite a few questions. So thank you for that. Uh, take a couple minutes and, and, and just look at those and, and, uh, and vote. Uh, our board has twice shut down the annual election in order to appoint their own people to open seats on the board. They refuse to at least appoint a candidate. Is this legal? Well, uh, put like that, you know, obviously you're, you're framing it in a way where it suggests that it's not. I would want to know more about what exactly is going on. Uh, HOAs constantly run into problems with uh, holding elections uh, because usually because of apathy, usually because there, there aren't enough people uh, running for seats. Uh, and there's often a situation, I see this with clients of mine all the time, where elections for one reason or another get delayed and that compounds from year to year so that things end up wildly out of whack in terms of knowing uh, when somebody's term ends, when their seat is up for election, who's up for election, when, what seats are open for election. Um, it can be very confusing. Uh, you know, I'd be curious to know, like I say, what exactly is going on here and maybe there, whether there are other issues in the background mm -hmm. that have made it difficult to hold an election. All things being equal, sure, you need to hold an election as often as the bylaws require. Um, the statutes have something to say about that as well. Um, the board usually isn't responsible for appointing a candidate. What, what needs to happen is there be a call for candidates that people can, can then uh, throw their hats in the ring. Um, but I would need to know more about the specific circumstances and what's going on to be able to give you sort of a yes or no answer to that question. I hope that helps. Okay. Candace, or Sarah, I guess it is. Is it okay for a board member to answer questions from other homeowners about items that were discussed at the meeting that already occurred? Yeah. Uh, look, guys, I, I realize when we're talking about these things, uh, people are human, uh, stuff happens. So uh, I would err on the side of not doing that, not answering questions, because uh, anytime you do, there's the risk that somebody will uh, misinterpret what you're saying and hold it against the HOA. Somebody wants to know what happened in a meeting. The best uh, way of finding that out, that out is to request the meeting minutes. That's the, doesn't matter. You know, if I'm a board member, you ask me what happened, what comes out of my mouth doesn't matter. What matters is what's in the meeting minutes. That's the official record of what actually occurred. You get into a situation of answering questions. It's probably not the worst thing in the world from an open meeting act standpoint, but I would stay away from it because it can cause confusion, it can cause dissension uh, and lead to, to issues that you don't necessarily need. I would err on the side of not doing that. I don't think it's the craziest thing in the world if it happens, just, just be very careful and bear in mind, anything you say is gonna be interpreted as you speaking on behalf of the HOA uh, and people will, uh, we've certainly seen situations where all kinds of uh, consternation and even threatened lawsuits come up because of confusion over things like that. So-and-so told me this, and so that must be what the HOA did. And now, you know, it's five months later, me yelling at the manager back and forth over email, and I'm going to bring my lawsuit. Well, that all started with a conversation that misunderstood what was going on. You want to know what happened in the meeting, ask for the meeting minutes. I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that, that is helpful. And, and I think you, you mentioned earlier about the board acting uh, for the entire community as mm -hmm. one body. And so having separate interests kind of can create problems. But by the same token, First Amendment says you have the opportunity to talk. If, if you're a board member, you want to speak English individually with a, another homeowner, you can do it. You're just taking a risk. And I think that's that's what uh, 
So it is okay, but it's risky. Let's put it. Yeah, down. yeah, I think uh, that's right. Okay, so a homeowner has has to basically sue themselves to get the board to comply with, with proper notice and agenda for a meeting. Is that correct? Meaning that expense comes out of the association funds and everyone pays into the uh, association to do that. I really appreciate this question. It's a great reminder. Uh, certainly, we see all the time uh, folks threatening lawsuits against their HOA, bringing lawsuits against their HOA, and not sort of understanding that anything that the HOA is spending to defend against that lawsuit is probably coming from your pockets. Um, that's that's the nature of a nonprofit organization. The HOA is only allowed to raise funds through monthly dues or through other uh, proper assessments. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. It, it is prohibited by law from raising more money than is needed to run the HOA. So if part of what's going on is legal fees either during or leading up to a lawsuit, that's all coming out of every homeowner's uh, pocket. Um, so if you have a concern about the board complying with the Open Meeting Act, and certainly we, we see this as well, I would say raise those concerns. Don't You don't need to file a lawsuit to have them addressed. Uh, I would raise those concerns, um, raise them with management, bring them up in the homeowners forum. Uh, I'm concerned the business is being conducted outside of properly noticed meetings. Uh, can we talk about that? There's also, this is a good time to mention, there's a number of tools for resolving issues in the community that have nothing to do with a lawsuit, okay? When you're talking about enforcement issues, I mentioned earlier, the HOA can send out a, a courtesy notice, can call the person to a hearing. Um, something that can happen, whether it's an enforcement issue or a homeowner uh, upset about something in the HOA, a great tool is what's called uh, internal dispute resolution, IDR. Um, and the idea is, and the legislature set this up specifically to sort of cut through the static. Uh, you know, Tensions have escalated, folks are threatening lawsuits against each other, everybody's mad. And the legislature has essentially said, sit down, talk to each other, try to work it out. Come, you know, come to a prearranged meeting, mutual, a mutually convenient uh, time and place, meet in good faith, hear each other out. The law literally says meet in good faith and hear each other out and try to work out uh, the issue. And if you're able to reach an agreement at that point and write it down, I always say you could be, be doing it on a cocktail napkin, it would still be binding on that homeowner in the HOA. You can reach an agreement and save everybody the headache and cost of formal mediation or even a lawsuit. If you're concerned that the board or management or somebody isn't doing something properly, I would raise the issue, uh, ask them to respond appropriately to it. And if you feel like you're not uh, getting an appropriate response, request an IDR, sit down with a representative of the board and try to work it out. You don't need to file a lawsuit to raise concerns about your own HOA. I hope that helps. Yeah, there's also a requirement to go through ADR, uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution. That's also in the Davis Sterling Act yes. uh, that requires it before you go to 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 uh, Superior Court and file a lawsuit. So you do have methods. Also, check out your governing documents because sometimes mm -hmm. the governing documents will have a process to uh, to look at uh, controversy or issues that are are raised during the community. It may be a little different than than what you have. Okay, and then here's an anonymous attendee, a board resignations. At what point is the board required to disclose to the membership that a board vacancy through resignation is upcoming or has occurred? Resignations often uh, occur for a number of reasons, but if members do not know, they cannot step up to volunteer. How do we avoid the cherry picking of one replacement candidate, candidate without noticing the opening to the membership, or better, getting uh, getting the opening deferred to the next election if one is upcoming. So the board needs to address that if they do have an opening, right? I actually have that in my HOA right now, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's funny. I don't really see this scenario play out so much. What I see play out is, um, you know, boards sort of fall by attrition uh, where, you know, there, there, there doesn't seem to be anyone to fill the seats. I've got so many boards where uh, they're supposed to have five members and they're stuck at three so that if anybody gets sick, they can't get business done. And that's a, that's a huge problem, just that uh, apathy. I don't know if there's anything, there might be in the governing documents, I don't know if there's anything specifically envisioning uh, affirmatively telling members uh, that there is a, a resignation, that there is an opening. Certainly, yeah, it's a good idea to tell folks so you get somebody to step up. I wouldn't recommend... Um, holding off until the next election. And I sort of alluded to why just a moment ago. Uh, you know, if the next election is 
you know, in a month and you're not conducting any business between now and then, uh, fine. Um, but if you're talking about a situation where a couple months or more are going to pass between now and the next election, you don't want the HOA to be paralyzed. You don't want a situation where you can't assemble a quorum because you've got a vacancy on the board. The board needs to be able to conduct the HOA's business. So we generally tell our clients, if you've got a vacancy at all, you need to do whatever it takes to fill it as soon as possible. Um, I've certainly seen situations where you know we're down to effectively two board members and three as a quorum, and the HOA is paralyzed. You can't conduct business. So I think definitely whatever it takes to get those seats filled as soon as possible. And certainly, yes, I would recommend uh, if you're having trouble finding someone to fill those seats, get the word out. Okay. So Lynn uh, Felsky asks, uh, what is the next step if a California HOA board ignores a member's submitted IDR? So they don't respond to the IDR. An instance has occurred in my HOA where the member submitted an IDR in writing almost two years ago and the HOA did nothing. Per Davis Sterling, uh, HOA board must select a board member to meet with the member when the IDR is submitted by the member. IDR meeting must happen expeditiously. Is that your understanding of the IDR and the process? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't prescribe a, a precise time frame, but the idea is, the idea is that it needs to happen uh, quickly. Again, I'd want to know more about the details of what's going on there. Is there some sort of uh, disconnect where uh, the information has a, has, hasn't made its way to the board? Um, so that somebody's had an opportunity to act on it. Certainly, I'd want to see that board uh, get their counsel involved to make sure that uh, you know they're they're acting in compliance with uh, the statute on IDR, and you get it set up. Um, if again, as with with all things, if somebody's having trouble uh, getting a response, you've got those two basic avenues. One is to contact uh, the manager um, and make sure it's getting addressed, and the other is to appear at the homeowners forum and say, you know. Uh, guys, I raised this issue some time ago. I haven't heard anything yet. Can we please get this scheduled and address uh, the issue? So I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, the, the one thing is the IDR is more of an internal dispute resolution. Okay. So it's it's less formal than an ADR. ADR uh, does have mandatory uh, response uh, times. So Yeah, and that's the way that's set up is if somebody's going to bring either the HOA or a homeowner intends to sue the other for basically failure to comply with the governing documents. Uh, yes, there is a requirement that before either side can file that lawsuit, they have to send out a particular notice to the other side. Uh, we're planning on this lawsuit. Um, this is your opportunity to have mediation with us, to have binding arbitration with us before we do that. And if there isn't a, a response in that time, and usually parties can work it out, the statute's pretty forgiving in terms of reaching an agreement. Uh, we're going to do the mediation within this time. Uh, I think there's even a part that says you can agree to extend that time period. Um, but the idea is uh, the courts, the legislature want to see folks try to work things out before they become a lawsuit. And again, too, with, and that's the, the ADR requirement before filing a lawsuit. Uh, IDR is not required. But again, the idea is uh, the, the government saying to us, please ratchet things down, do what you can to work things out before running off to court with whatever it is. Um, and it's intended, as David says, to be an informal uh, process, a relatively easy to navigate process uh, where you don't necessarily want uh, one counsel present in the room because that can tend to ratchet things up. Um, not that I'm so scary and imposing, but just me being the lawyer in the room can escalate things. Um, an IDR is intended to cut through the static. It's intended to facilitate people talking to each other as people and reaching a resolution. If you have a problem, uh, that's a lot of what I do, and uh, Echo does. We'll we're happy to talk with you and strategize on your next steps on and what to do about uh, a conflict resolution. Um, and so this is a really good question, and it is uh, one I get almost. I get I have already had two this week. People have called in and asked about it. So uh, thank you, Lynn, for that. We have about uh, time for two more questions or so. Um, let's go to the next one here with nine upvotes and from anonymous attendee. What is a manager's role in keeping a board meeting running smoothly without interruptions from audience uh, once homeowners, the homeowners for, forum is over? How do you stop owners from emailing board members directly and complaints with complaints and requests once it has become common practice? Mm, okay, so we've got two different issues there. That's Great questions, both of them. Yeah. Um, 
you know, usually the manager is probably in the best position to sort of keep meetings on track. It's not necessarily their obligation, um, but they might be best suited. Uh, I've done things where I've sort of recommended, you know, for the homeowners forum, if we think it's going to be uh, a lot of folks with a lot of things they want to talk about, let's have an egg timer uh, and, you know, or, or one of those little hourglasses and flip it when somebody starts talking, flip it back when, uh, when the time's up. Um, it can be a problem. Certainly. I've had meetings where uh, they went on and on and on and on, not because the manager was failing to do anything or the board was failing to do anything, but just because folks kept chiming in and it's a difficult balance to strike of sort of saying to folks, we've heard from you. Thanks very much. We need to conduct the business now without being rude to those individuals. Uh, it's very difficult, you know, if you're a board member and you're looking at your neighbors um, to sort of get them to stop interrupting without being uh, rude about it. So it's a difficult balance to strike. Uh, like I say, management might be in the best role, but that doesn't mean it's, it's always going to work properly. How do you stop owners from emailing board members directly with complaints and requests once it has become common practice? Great question. Everybody grapples with this. We live in an age where we all use email for absolutely everything. We use text for everything. We use Slack. We use this. We use that. Um, you stop that by changing the culture. And what I mean is this. Uh, do board trainings specifically for your board, similar to this presentation, do homeowner trainings to address the same issues so that everybody has an, starts to develop an understanding of how things are supposed to work, how you're supposed to communicate with the HOA. Um, put together, work with your council to put together a code of conduct. So everybody has that sort of, you adopt it as a policy for the HOA and everybody has that written understanding of how things are supposed to be work, but uh, supposed to work. But I think the biggest thing is for the board members to take it upon themselves to say, Thanks very much. I can't actually do anything for you, but we'll look into getting it on the agenda um, and just getting the habit of saying that. It's difficult. I know you get the emails, the phone calls, everything else. Um, you got to develop that habit and, and respond that way. And people will get the idea and start directing things to the manager. It's, it's ineffective anyway. Uh, you can't actually give them an answer. So uh, tell them the best route is to notify management or come to the homeowners forum in the next meeting. So I hope that helps. That's, those are a couple of great questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's the last one. I think we're a little bit behind schedule here, so we'll catch up. Uh, I want to say thanks, Lance, for, for helping us today and being part of this. I believe you're going to be on one of our Ask the Attorneys coming up very soon. So yep. uh, if you want to talk to, to Lance about a couple more things, it's going to be available. We'll have a lot more questions and opportunity to talk. Uh, we have 90 uh, questions in the cube still. And <laughs> I think, uh, so I knew it was going to be a lot today. We'll it's going to be crazy. So uh, come back to one of the other sessions that we have, and we'll be able to answer some of these questions. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and say thank you again to our uh, sponsor for today, Heritage Bank of Commerce, Linnell and Chris. Thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate you uh, beyond your belief. Honestly, we really thank them for, for helping support ECHO and allowing us to continue on to provide excellence in educational opportunities here. So thank you so much. Um, and so let's uh, let me thank all of the members who, for coming today. Also, thank you. you. You've been awesome. We appreciate it, especially the, the large number of you. Uh, for those of you who are not members, you are invited to become a member. Uh, you or your community can join by going to www.echo-ca.org and clicking on the membership tab. For our members, please invite your friends, boards, and especially management firms and vendors to join ECHO. A simple invitation is often all it takes to encourage a person to become an ECHO member. Please help us to grow and support this ongoing effort to provide excellence in education. This year, ECHO is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and I am personally inviting you to attend our 50th anniversary celebration. It'll be on Friday, May 5th, from 4 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at Pinstripes Bistro in San Mateo. Please come and participate. We hope to see all of you there. It's going to be an amazing milestone event. Registration is available on our website. If you act fast, we still have our early bird open, and you can get a ticket for 25 bucks. And uh, we're going to have uh, lots of things happening there, including bowling and, and bocce, but also the traditional things. We're giving out awards as well, so that'll be it'll be a fun event, and it's our 50th. 
Uh, if you have some time, we would like uh, and would like to be more involved with ECHO. We have several opportunities available to you. Please refer to the slide. Uh, if you can see it on the side here, uh, if you see anything that looks interesting, please send me an email at dzapponi at echo-ca.org uh, and become part of the organization, become more involved with us. Now for our other announcements, the East Bay Resource Panel and TCAR, the Echo Club at Rossmore, is scheduled to meet in person on April 26th from 9.30 a.m. 11.30 a.m. We'll have a little breakfast, uh, uh, light breakfast for everybody that attends. Uh, oh, heck, that one sold out. I'm sorry. That uh, Just a note, uh, our, our programs, uh, they sell out once in a while. Uh, we, we will be discussing basic landscaping, uh, irrigation, layout, and maintenance. So this will be a, this is a great, great session. From uh, black backflows, uh, to bubblers and everything in between for your irrigation systems. Um, sorry, it is sold out. So um, uh, next time. Uh, also, we invite any HOA board members or former board members uh, to join the ECHO uh, Board Members Club. The club meets via Zoom every second Tuesday of the month from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And uh, our next meeting is May 9th. And we will be discussing the legal business of HOAs law firms, arbitration, collections, and foreclosures. And this is only open to, uh, it's peer to peer. So it's only open to board members who are ECHO members. So uh, you'll, and so we don't have the attorneys in there. We don't have the vendors in there. So it's a really good opportunity for you to share ideas and, and really uh, get into some of these things that are uh, challenging you and in a very uh, secure environment. Uh, as a member of the board members club, the board members club is open only to ECHO members. I just went through all of this. And if you want to join the club, uh, contact Connor at uh, Connor at echo-ca.org. Connor will send you uh, an application form to be a club member. Once again, thank you to all of our sponsors for making this workshop possible. And thank you to Lance uh, Stuart, for designing and presenting the program today. You covered a ton of information very quickly. I'm glad you did. We had a lot of questions. And of course, to all of you for attending today and making this event a success, ECHO appreciates your investment in education to foster a better quality of life in HOA communities. 